Okay, so we're going to talk about the comic book movies you'd put on your own personal Mount Rushmore. This was a viral tweet that was doing the rounds this week, but um, I'm going to avoid talking about potentially some of the more obvious ones for the sake of avoiding repetition with everyone else's choices here. I love Spider-Verse to, to bits. I think it probably is the best comic book movie ever, but for the sake of making this Mount Rushmore quintessentially you and I'm going to go with a few picks that I feel as though best sum up my brand as a comic book dork. So I'm going to start off first with Batman. Batman 1989 by Tim Burton and um, this was a film that I came to relatively late uh, obviously because I was born in 1996 and you don't get much later than that um, but the fact that growing up I wasn't allowed to watch Batman 1989 I was allowed to to rent Batman and Robin um, from the local video store we had uh, in Liverpool in Hale Woods that we could go to all the time um, but I was not allowed to watch the original Batman because when I was younger my dad accidentally rented Batman Returns and I got very scared of the bit where Selina Kyle died so that was Batman 89 ruled out for a very long period of time but whatever flash forward uh, many years until I'm about like 12 I want to say and I finally got to watch it and by that point I'd already seen the Christopher Nolan films or whatever and you know very much familiar with the Batman animated series and stuff um but I think aesthetically and just visually oh my god th there is there is a unique beauty to Tim Burton's portrayal of Batman's comics and while yes it's not the most faithful thing ever in a few aspects you know making Joker the murderer of Bruce Wayne's parents is a little bit dumb and also the fact that it kickstarted the whole Batman kills on the big screen trend is kind of not fun either but you know you can't take away anything else that makes that film iconic Michael Keaton is still the best live action Batman I'm gonna say um, Danny Elfman's score is yet to be topped and just I cannot overstate just how much that film influenced um, future Batman products obviously on, on the big and small screens but also the comics as well you know it introduced more of those um, or reintroduced rather those gothic sensibilities back into the comics and yeah what, what more can you say Batman 89 is incredible. My next pick is going to be Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from 1990. Now this film turns 31 years old this year um, and I got to watch it when I was having my big TMNT phase growing up. There was the 2003 cartoon and it eventually got so big and popular that in the UK they re-released the 1990 film. Now being a seven year old at the time, I didn't have a, I, didn't, I thought it was a brand new movie. I thought this thing had been delivered uh, and it, it was just brand new. I had no concept of time, but I genuinely I think the 1990 TMNT movie does not get enough credit and yes in case you didn't know already the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were <laughs> originally a comic from Mirage by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird before they were the iconic cartoon show um, and yeah the movie itself is such a great adaptation um, of the source material in the sense that I think it distills both the inherent darkness of the original comics and balances it with, you know, the levity and, and the fun nature of the 80s cartoon, which would then in itself go on to inspire the 2003 cartoon, which in itself was also quite dark. And um, I just love this film. Um, it is quite dark, but I feel as though if you're going to... They got the fact they made those suits work. I know you've seen the memes where you see the stunt man inside and he's got his, his big grin coming from inside the turtle's mouth. So he's got like a hidden inner mouth, like he's some sort of kind of reptilian xenomorph. I know, forget about it. It looks fantastic in live action. The action is great as well. Um, all the performances are fantastic too. I just really think that TMNT 1990 is quite underrated. And if I'm gonna talk about, you know, <laughs> those formative combat movies that I love growing up, um, that's going to be on there. The next item on my, on Ewan Patterson's uh, comic book movie Mount Rushmore is actually going to be my favourite comic book movie of all time. I know I think Spider-Verse is uh, unquestionably the best, but in terms of, you know, a movie that I think really kind of distills what I love about DC and what I love about Batman and what I love in particular about the DC animated universe, it has to be Batman Beyond Return of the Joker. Now, um, Batman Beyond as a concept, uh, when it was first introduced, was not going to be like, um, people were kind of against it, especially the people that were actually tasked with making the show. You know, a teenage Batman set in the future, like, that shouldn't work on paper. But lo and behold, you know, Bruce Tim, Paul Dini, and all the other fine folks at Warner Brothers Animation in the late 90s turned around and crafted one of the most unique and creative interpretations of The Dark Knight we've ever seen in taking the character to a sort of Blade Runner inspired Neo Gotham and Return of the Joker, what that film does is it marries 
the kind of the, the past of Batman with his future. And it's all about legacy and, and the different legacies of Batman and the Joker. And all throughout the TV show, we had no idea what had happened to the Joker. Um, Bruce had been uh, deliberately coy on the topic with Terry McGinnis throughout the majority of the show. And then we finally got our answer to what actually happened in this film. And you know, it's probably most famous quite rightly for its 10 minute flashback sequence that takes place towards the end of the second act. Um, but yeah, on the whole, Return of the Joker is just incredible. It sums up everything that's great about the DC animated universe. And I know people like Mask of the Phantasm too. Mask of the Phantasm is amazing, but Return of the Joker, it just has that added uniqueness that, that makes it all special. And it also has one of my favorite comic book movie lines ever. And that is about what Bruce says to Terry at the end of the film about what makes Batman and how it isn't just the mask. It's about the person behind the mask. And I think that's a great message to sell. But yeah, uh, finally, my final item on the Mount Rushmore of comic book movies, uh, it has to be Spider-Man 2002. Now, um, when I was growing up, I loved this film. I had to flash forward the bit when Uncle Ben died because that's really upsetting. <laughs> because it generally is really upsetting. I, even watching it now is very upsetting. Um, but, there was a period around about like when I was a young teenager where I was like, oh, that, it's all corny, isn't it? It's all, no, it's not, because I read the Ultimate Spider-Man comics. Um, but then as I've grown older again, I've fallen back in love with those films, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films, because they are an incredibly authentic adaptation of the original Stan Lee and Steve Ditko comics and the John Romita comics and Jerry Conray as well is another person who was heavily influenced, um, the, the film was heavily influenced by. And I'm gonna go with the first one over the second just purely because I just, I, there is a feeling, there is an element of nostalgia value there, obviously, um, but I don't think people, you, it's, you can really overstate just how big this film was when it dropped, you know, the soundtracks, whatever. The Spider-Man 2 soundtrack was better, I have to say, but yeah. Um, and obviously Willem Dafoe as Green Goblin. Willem Dafoe is just having a great time in this movie, as is everyone else, and yeah, I still think it is better than Spider-Man 2, but like a hair's breadth. Um, but yeah, I love it. I love both Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2. And it, we don't celebrate Thanksgiving here in the UK, but it's a Thanksgiving movie, so you should all go watch it on Thanksgiving. Watch it right now. Don't limit yourself to a holiday. Watch Spider-Man 2002 because it's great. And not just because of the Chad Groger hero song, which is unironically great. I'm gonna say right now, or maybe it is just ironically great. I don't know, I'm talking for too long now, but yeah. Spider-Man 2002, the last item on the comic book movie Mount Rushmore, along with Batman 1989, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1990, Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, and that's it, so yeah. So if we're talking about comic book movies, um, I do have to admit that for a lot of the movies I saw, for the longest time I didn't actually realize they were even based off comic books. So without realizing it, I fell in love with a lot of films throughout my life, um, that are comic book movies but completely went over my head. Stuff like um, Robocop and Men in Black and so Men in Black is my first one um, because even now all these years later when people point out there's probably loads of problems with it and a lot of like the special effects and stuff kind of janky and it's a little bit ugly but that film has such a special place in my heart because I'm fairly sure I had it on DVD um, because if I didn't they must have just played it on TV a lot because me and my brother watched that film so much. The idea of like these goofy aliens cutting about and like um, the two main men with their weird dynamic and that was that was probably my first introduction to Will Smith um, who I'm fairly sure I had a giant crush on. I mean who didn't? He's Will Smith, who didn't? I was convinced for a while that you could actually get like a little thing that you could use to wipe someone's memory like their one with a little red light. That would have been great. Um, I was gonna make a really dark joke, not YouTube appropriate joke. Let's not go there. Um, moving away from what I watched when I was younger, there's actually an embarrassing amount of films that I've watched, not recently, but within the past few years that I didn't, once again, know were based off comics until I Googled it a few minutes ago um, and found out that uh, Big Hero 6 is based on a comic. That's really embarrassing that I didn't know that, but I had no clue. I mean, it's fitting because it took me a long time to watch the film as well. Like, I watched it a long time after it came out. Um, and I just thought it was such a lovely film. Like, I definitely cried. I feel like a lot of us cried. Um, who isn't gonna? Uh, when it's such, like, 
a heavy film at times. It covers like some really heavy topics of grief and like moving on, but also like keeping your loved ones with you. I think if I could pick any um, animated or comic book city to live in, San Francisco would be pretty up there because that place is gorgeous. Like I was stunned by how much I loved the setting for the film. Um, and outside of that, I just really love the idea of carving Baymax into a giant rock. Like having a bunch of like cool guy faces around him, like he's next to like Will Smith or like, I don't know, Chris Evans. And then you've got Baymax bang in the middle, that beautiful blob of care and love. Oh, if you're gonna, if you're gonna deface um, a beautiful mountainscape, um, then you may as well do it with Baymax. Anyone that knows me knows that I will watch anything by Edgar Wright. Um, and one of my favorites has to be Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. I did surprisingly know that that came from a comic, maybe because of the style that the film is done in, sort of, it's really hard to avoid. Basically, I just love everything about the editing of that film, every sort of essence that gives it its feeling, its aura, its vibe, if you will. Um, I know that Scott Pilgrim is not a good guy. He's, he's, really not like let's not it's 2021 let's stop covering for Scott Pilgrim he tried to date a school child um, but if we put that aside and accept that the film doesn't always maybe paint him in the best of lights and that we don't necessarily need to root for him it's a really really charming film with a really good soundtrack some gorgeous editing and cinematography and it's it's one of my comfort films like a feel-good film if I'm having a really bad week I know that there's a host of films that I can always fall back on. Um, I was going to give an example and really embarrass myself by admitting the Lego movies on there. I've watched that like three times just because I've been in a really bad place. I'm like, stick the Lego movie on. Um, but my other film on that list is Scott Pilgrim vs. The World because it always just makes me feel so good. All the colours, all the brightness, all the fast pace, everything. Oh, and Michael Cera. Not chef's kiss to Michael Sarah. I mean, I don't think of him in that way. Um, he's more like a weird cousin. <laughs> I'm gonna stop. So when I first saw Birds of Prey, I made the mistake when it came out of looking on Twitter when I was still sort of forming my opinion on it. Um, so when I saw this, I went in with kind of low expectations because Hollywood does have a tendency to take on like an all female led idea um, and then make it terrible. Just do a really, really shoddy job of it. Um, but no, I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed Ewan McGregor as our villain as well. I even more so enjoyed him getting blown up at the end. Like, what a way to go. If I'm gonna go, if I'm gonna go, when I go, I'll be a little disappointed if it's anything less bombastic than that. I did think that some of the characters could stand to be a bit more fleshed out. Um, but in general, I liked all of them and I cared about them and I cared about their relationships and it kept like a forward momentum the whole time. I was engaged, I was having fun. I came out of the cinema and I looked on Twitter and everyone was just berating it. It seemed like everyone apart from me, everyone on earth hated it and nobody enjoyed the film and everyone thought that there was more problems with it than there was good moments. And I just didn't get that at all. I really, really enjoyed the film. And once again, we're coming back to who I want to carve into some rock, Baymax, Harley Quinn. You don't even need more people after that, Baymax, Margot Robbie, boom. That's all you need. Give me a big piece of rock, I'll make it now. Okay, so my personal Mount Rushmore of comic book movies begins with Batman Returns, the, uh, the 1992 classic, because it's just got this lovely, gothic, whimsical aesthetic which exemplifies Tim Burton at his absolute best. You know, and the film strikes the perfect balance of like dark and dangerous with fun and exciting, which I feel is kind of missing, sadly, from the later, very serious Batman efforts. Uh, the cast is phenomenal, you know, with Michael Keaton at the helm as Batman, uh, with Michael Goff as Alfred, and then Christopher Walken, Michelle Pfeiffer, Danny DeVito, all together. It, it's just, it's such great casting. And it's all tied together by Danny Elfman's score, which is again, to use the word again, whimsical and just fun and lovely and very, very nostalgic. Moving on from that, we have Logan. Now, the X-Men films 
are some of my favourite comic book movies, uh, a fair few of them anyway, and Logan is this knowing swan song for the franchise, with this incredible elegiac tone and it gives it a real kind of sense of finality and tragedy. You know, it's a personal, intimate little story rather than a big apocalyptic blowout, which I think is great, and especially the idea of Professor Xavier, the world's most powerful telepath, losing control of his mind and his powers, that's both tragic and really terrifying. Throw in that neo-noir western vibe that it's got, and it's just perfection in a film. Like, utter perfection. And speaking of perfection, there's then uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, and I'm a really big fan of animated films outside of kind of boring modern CGI, and this just has so many details, so much going for it. The most notable is the idea of Miles Morales being animated on twos and Peter Parker being animated on ones to show their relative skill in web slinging. There's all kinds of other things, the motion blur being achieved by having colours kind of misaligned and smeared as if this is printed media that we're looking at, uh, the use of, of all your visual sort of onomatopoeia, uh, bagel in particular, if you know what I'm talking about, and its comedy overall is great, the story's got loads of heart, it's just, it's like a work of art from start to finish and there's just nothing like it. And finally, I want to talk about Dread, because Dread is a seriously underrated film. Like, it's not the best on this list, it's probably the least good on this list, but it's just worth a watch as a video game adaptation without a video game to adapt from. There's very little plot, it's simply two judges, Dredd and Anderson, fighting off a seemingly sort of inexhaustible supply of goons in this lockdown mega block, just getting higher and higher and higher and higher, and the escalation of violence is ridiculous. It just reaches really absurd heights and it's probably a film that's passed you by because it wasn't that well received but you know what it's just worth a watch because if nothing else it's just good fun Right, I'm just going to take a punt on this because no one's ever going to agree with anybody when it comes to this Mount Rushmore discussion. But in my opinion, my comic book movies that make it onto my Mount Rushmore are Captain America First Avenger because as you already know, I'm a team cap guy and that film just achieved so much. You've got like an honest, earnest superhero which should not work in these current cynical times but it just does because Chris Evans is just the most morally sound human being on planet Earth and that plane scene, oh my god. That plane scene at the end of that film, it will just continually always just reduce me to a, a rubble of mess on the floor, crying and sobbing just over how cruel life is. And then after this, you gotta throw X2 in there, X-Men, the, the sequel to the 2000 movie X-Men, which then obviously you got Wolverine delving into his Alkali Lake backstory, going full berserker in the mansion, just ripping everybody to shreds. Hugh Jackman was just on form, man. I just I will never get over that. I don't think he's ever been better. I challenge you, Logan. I don't think he's ever been better than what he was in X2. X2. You've got all the stuff that goes down with like Bobby, Iceman, his family, how they don't accept it because he's a mutant, how that's like a commentary on society's view, like on certain minorities. That is all in this film as well. It's just got so much. And the Nightcrawler scene in the White House. It's just what more do you want in a superhero film? And then I'm going to stay in the Fox universe. We're going to go X Men Days of Future past yeah you know you got you got your patrick stewart's your ian mckellen's your hugh jackman your Halle berry you got that brilliant era there we're gonna take them and we're gonna throw them together with james mcavoy and michael fassbender and jennifer lawrence just throw them on a movie together and just watch the money roll in and the tears roll down and the cheers go up because i loved it this was incredible this is exactly what i wanted i'm a huge fan of both eras throwing them all together having hugh jackman just swing his like bone claws around but naked it was great stuff what more do you want in a superhero movie and on top of this, you had Magneto just moving an entire stadium with his powers just being a super crazy dude. And then you also had Jennifer Lawrence putting in her best performance as Mystique slash Raven. And obviously, we also had um, Peter Dinklage. He turned up, he was in it as Trask. It was just, that film was packing all the punches, it was packing all the star power, and it just retconned everything in the best way possible. 
And lastly, my last film on my Mount Rushmore of coin book movies, it has to be Thor Ragnarok. I know I could have said Civil War, Avengers Endgame, Avengers Infinity War, Dark Knight, Man of Steel, all these incredible films that I do love, I do cherish, I do enjoy. But Ragnarok is just, it's my comfort blanket. It's just the film that I always go to, no matter what time of year, what time of day. It's got, like, incredible laughs left, right and centre. I mean, piss off, ghost. Like, who doesn't laugh? It's just incredible. I love it. All the great stuff. And then you got the, the emotional weight of Odin's death and all that comes with that. Thor finally becoming the true king of Asgard and his like conflict and story and history with Loki it's just he's got everything and then the cinematography oh I could just keep I could go on I could do a full 10 minute video just of Thor Ragnarok the Valkyrie scene against Hela it's just mwaha great stuff I get very passionate about this kind of thing so I'm very happy to talk about it but there's a lot of films left off but if I had to say at this moment in time whatever day we're recording and whatever time I'm recording that is my Mount Rushmore it will probably change now, can I start again? So for my Mount Rushmore, my top four comic book movies, dead or alive, I've got a few classics and a few that might be a bit controversial. We're gonna start off with one that everyone loves, and it's um, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2, which is one of the best comic book movies of all time, in my opinion. And now I was tempted to put Spider-Man 1 on here, because I think that's almost just as good. It's much goofier and much sillier, but I think it still has the same heart and it's a lot of fun, but I like that for all of the same reasons that Ewan is gonna talk about Spider-Man 1 for. But Spider-Man 2 kind of takes it up a notch and is it's more cinematic. You get a villain that is, you know, not to throw shade on Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin, but Alfred Molina's Doc Ock is one of the greatest um, comic book movie villains ever. Like, there's a depth to them. The relationship between him and Peter Parker has the same parallels. It just has a level of storytelling to it that a lot of comic book movies don't quite aim for because it puts the focus on Peter Parker as a human. And the best thing about Spider-Man is that you can relate to him. He's got everyday problems. You know, it's a cliche at this point, but he does have everyday problems that we deal with alongside, you know, fighting crime in the nighttime. And this movie perfectly captures that and makes him so relatable, makes the relationship at the heart of it so strong and endearing. And, you know, you've got Ant-Man in there, who is just the best Ant-Man of all time. No shade at Marissa Tomai or Sally Field, but it just comes together in the perfect superhero movie of all time. And another perfect superhero movie of all time, in my opinion, is Blade 1. Now, I know a lot of people might say Blade 2 is better, and it certainly is more comic booky and more superhero-y. The colours are kind of more vibrant. It's kind of more inspired by... Perhaps, it might sound dumb saying this, but it's more overtly kind of like supernatural and pulpy. Whereas Blade 1, for me, works a bit better. Because it's just a straight up like rip roaring 90s action movie for better or worse, it has a lot of drawbacks. The CGI isn't so good, but it's straightforward plot of, you know, Wesley Snipes' Blade just kicking the ever loving crap out of vampires in the coolest way, set to the coolest late 90s um, techno. Like it's great. From the very first moment where you have that guy going into the rave full of vampires and the sprinklers, you know, are sprinkling down blood, and then you've got Blade coming in kicking, like I said, the absolute crap out of everyone. It's just like non-stop and I think the casting of Wesley Snipes is great. I think the casting of Chris Christopherson as Whistler is inspired. That's awesome. The dynamic between them is so good and you end with this excellent fight. And also it's scary, you know, even though the second one is also scary, I think the first one has like, it again, it sounds a bit dumb, but it has a groundedness to it that um, just keeps it terrifying for me throughout. It was one of the first DVDs I ever got and I'll remember it forever. Third on my Mount Rushmore thing is Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Again, I think I'm just choosing <laughs> entries in franchises that people might disagree with because I know people love Guardians 1 a bit more, but for me, Guardians 1 didn't quite click with me. I enjoyed the team dynamic, but I thought the villain was a bit weak, didn't really appreciate the third act. Guardians 2 was just kind of like a James Gunn vehicle through and through, and I love, again, the family dynamic at the heart of it. For me, when, I, when it comes to comic book movies, I'm here for the spectacle, of course. Who doesn't love a really good fight scene or whatever? But I just want the relationship with the characters to feel earned and, you know, again, a bit relatable and seeing Star-Lord, you know, go through this whole thing with his distant father, seeing like the team fall apart and come back together. All of that's so well done. It has such a strong personality. The soundtrack is great. It is just distinctive. And again, I'll never forget going to see that at midnight with my friends, not expecting to, to enjoy it. Cause like I said, I didn't really like the first one and I was just blown away. I thought it was like a five-star thing. Like when it comes to like the top of the MCU's um, you know, offerings. I don't think Guardians 2 should be um, forgotten about because it just is, in my opinion, better than the first. But if you enjoy the first, of course, that's fine. You know, I'm not the police, you know? 
I'm pleased for you. I wish I enjoyed it as much as you did. Finally, I'm gonna go non-superhero E for my last one because um, it would be wrong for me to not shout out Bong Joon-ho's Snowpiercer, which was the first Bong Joon-ho movie I ever watched. I it was his first in um, the English language and it's based off a graphic novel that I haven't read so I don't know how it really compares. But I just thought this was just such an event of film. You've got all of these characters trapped on this train car and they're kind of like in the absolute lowest class possible. They get, you know, awful food, awful conditions and eventually they have to break from one train car to the next because it's the last kind of hub of civilization in the entire world after an apocalyptic event and they're trying to get to the front of the train car to kind of take control and stuff. And each train car, I've said that a lot, it's really doing my head in, is kind of like distinctly themed around something. And just like the visual storytelling in there is great. It's so imaginative. You've got Tilda Swinton doing this weird, weird like slapstick Margaret Thatcher-esque performance that's just so weird and so kind of dumb, but it works. Like you, you buy into how sinister she is, even though she is so comic. And you've got Chris Evans in the main role and he gives such a, subtly emotional performance. You don't find out much about his character until the end, but he delivers one of the, the most devastating monologues ever. So I'm not gonna ramble anymore. Those are my four. Guardians 2, Blade 1, Spider-Man 2, and Snowpiercer. Um, there are so many other contenders, but I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna stick with those.